Good evening, everyone. It is Friday. It is the first Friday of October, as I call it, Tomtober, because it's my birthday month. And uh, first Fridays are always uh, time for First Stone, First Stone service. Um, that's the service we would hold at church the first Friday of the month for folks who can't make it to church or well, for whatever reason can't come to church uh, on a Sunday or whatever it might be. Uh, I've been doing this, I think, seven months. I think this is my seventh or eighth uh online first stone service but you know what that um covid covid rules we gotta change things up and so i'm glad you're joining with me on a friday night or maybe you're seeing this after friday night whichever works whatever whatever works for you we're pretty easy around here uh tonight i've got a, a an interesting um uh topic but i'm going to address i'm going to address justice's comment he says is hunting a sin no hunting's not a sin all the animals were put here for our purposes i don't think you should hunt this is just me uh, just for the sport of it, because what sport of it is it just to go kill something? Um, but there are a lot of people that hunt for meat and, and uh, uh, you know, lifestyle and those kind of things. So that that's kind of good. I've never been a trophy hunter, just going out and killing an animal so you can put their head on a wall. That's just not my thing. Um, they're all God's creatures. So I think you have to be judicious about it. But uh, I know a lot of hunters do it for the meat. They stock their lockers up and um, that's that's fine. That's That's not something that God had a problem with. Okay, uh, if you read the uh, sermon title, I think you can read the sermon title on this thing. Uh, I called it Love Doesn't Conquer All, But Intentionality Does. It was a concept that uh, has been rolling in my head for decades, uh, but but something that I put to words just uh, yesterday, I think. I was I was in a, uh, um, in a counseling session with a couple, and I was explaining to them that, you know, everyone thinks love conquers all. And um, it would be nice, and it's true, if uh, if we didn't have fallen emotions, it would be true if we weren't sinful people. It would be true if we weren't selfish. It would be true if, if we could just follow God and do what we're supposed to do. But the reality is, we don't do that. Um, we are fallen. We rebel against God. We don't do things his way. Uh, we are incredibly selfish. And so love isn't the thing that conquers all. Now, uh, you, you, and you know this. I mean, you know this intuitively because you see people who had been in love who no longer are. And or the two people that were um, in love and are not together um, for whatever reason. And, and it, it comes down to intentionality because what I said to this couple was, you know, you can talk all you want to about being in love and that's a great thing. Um, but what, in, what conquers everything is intentionality. And so if you're intentional about love, understanding that love is a choice and not an emotion, love is a, a decision you make, not a feeling you have, um, then you get to be very intentional about what you're doing. And then you get to do the stuff that you're called to do that would fall in line with what Christ calls us to as, as Christians. Not that it's easy because it's really not. Uh, but I, I wanted to focus on a piece of scripture that I think is really important, and I don't hear it preached on enough. Um, in fact, I haven't heard it preached on in, in years. Uh, but I want to I want to dive into this thing. I got some glasses around here somewhere. Actually, I got four pair of glasses. I'm just trying to figure out which one I want to wear. Uh, this is from from uh, Luke 14, and it's it's verses 25 through 34. And I'm going to jump ahead to 28 and uh, um, talk about this part first, and then a second part, and then get into the context of it. It says, this is Jesus talking, and he, he's with, with disciples. And he says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. And and, and I love I love the story because it's just so, so uh, like, common day thing if you go to do something and you didn't like plan you're going to look stupid and then people are going to make fun of you because you were stupid um i, I just love the the honesty about that but he, he's making a point and it's about considering the cost of things right and and so what he's talking about in this context is if you're going to follow jesus you got to consider the cost. I mean, uh, you, you don't just go into it and, you know, all excited and, and jump in both feet to be a Christian. And, oh, man, this is the best thing ever. And then it gets hard. And you're like, wow, I didn't want to do this. And then people do ridicule you. Or uh, you can jump in to be a Christian. You're all excited about it. And you love the Christian stuff that's fun to do. But you really don't do the Christian stuff that's not fun to do. And then you look like a hypocrite. And people make fun of you. Uh, that's that's kind of uh, what, what he's talking about. But he, he goes on. He uses a second he uses a second story he says 
So suppose a king is about to go to war and he's going to go against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the others are still a long way off and he will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. And, and so, you know, he was really laying the gauntlet down in this in this chapter 14 of Luke, because what he was saying to, to lead into this was, if you don't hate your mother and don't hate your father, you have no part of me. Which in that culture was like just radical, crazy kind of stuff. It's as radical and crazy as, as uh, parents must have been during the 60s watching the hippies and the and the free love generation do what they were doing. They, they must have just, their heads were exploding. Well, Jesus was, was calling people and saying, look, if you're going to follow me, you're going to be a disciple. You're going to, you're going to be uh, someone who, who is walking in my footsteps. I've got to be the main thing. And, and it doesn't mean you don't love your mother and father. It doesn't mean that uh, any of that stuff. It means that I'm number one. And if you love something more than you love him, then you don't love him the way you have to. And he's not someone you should follow. And he's not someone who's going to be able to do for you the things that you think he's going to do. Um, and I love this thing about, about the king. So here you are with 10,000 men and, you're in, and the opposing force has 20,000. Don't you think you'll make peace with them instead of get your butt kicked? And he's like, you know, where are you compromising? Are you smart? Do you know what you're doing? Have you thought this through? Are you thinking through this stuff? So let me read the first part of this verse. This is, this is the setup. I kind of told you the punchline, but let me give you the setup. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And when we're talking large crowds, we're talking not just like 20s or 30s, hundreds and thousands. And turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate, hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now think about that for a second. We just talked about the family piece for first century Judeans. That's crazy. I mean, you, you would never put anything above family in, in that except God himself. And so Jesus is saying, I am God. You have to put me first. And, you know, if you, if you accepted him as Messiah, you did that. If you didn't accept him as Messiah, um, this was hard learning. But then he says this interesting thing. He has got to carry your cross and follow or you can't be my disciple. He's not talked much about going to the cross yet. And in that culture, going to the cross was a very negative thing. Being nailed to a tree, as they called it, um, it was a Roman punishment. It meant that you were a criminal. It meant that you were, you know, enemy of the state of Rome. You were, you were someone who was um, uh, rebelling against Caesar and maybe even, uh, even, even Herod, the king. And you would be crucified. And so here he is saying you have to pick up your cross, pick up your, pick up your, your staff kind of thing, and you got to carry it and and follow him. And there's some debate whether the word cross was used or not. What's fascinating, just as a side note, if you read Messianic Jews, Aramaic um, translations, and, and and people that that uh, believe that are that are they believe Jesus was Messiah, but they come from from a Jewish perspective, um, like they're Jews, they won't translate that word cross. They'll translate it staff. And obviously it has clearly different meanings, right? Um, so so we use the word cross because we think that's what he meant. Um, so he's telling this group that's traveling with him before he says, measure the cost. Before you think about something, you better think what this is going to cost you. Um, he, he's telling them, look, I'm telling you what it's going to cost you. You got to you got to put me first. You, you got to hate your life. You got to hate this world. You've got to uh, put your mom and dad, and your brother and sister, and your wife and everybody second. They, they come behind me, and you better measure the cost before you choose me. And uh, um, it's it's a pretty significant deal. And I want to kind of talk. I know that I told you I was going to talk about intentionality, and I'm going to. But I want to I want to talk about. This love piece, you know, didn't say God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever shall believe in him shall have, shall not die but have eternal life. God so loved the world. God made a decision, right? Uh, before the beginning of the world, of course, he knows everything because he's omniscient. He knows everything. He knew Adam and Eve would sin. He knew the creation would fall. He knew what would happen, right? Um, but he also had a plan for, for reconciliation and redemption and, and everything else. And that plan was a decision. He decided that he would reconcile man to himself. He decided he would pay the price for our transgressions. He decided 
um, that he loved us and he would show that love through a decision. And Jesus, uh, in, in a, a remarkable uh, verse, says uh, in John 10, 18, he, he's talking about his life. And he says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. This command I have received from my father. And he says, nobody takes my life from me. Nobody's killing me. I'm making this decision. I love you. I'm making a decision out of that love. And he's very, very intentional about what he's doing. Now, if you think about the life of Jesus, the whole thing's intentional. Him, him coming out of heaven and, and, and being incarnate in, in a human body, this idea that he would give up the independent use of his divine authorities, omniscience, omnipresence, uh, uh, omnipotence, he would give that up. He would be indwelt bodily by the Holy Spirit after his baptism, and he would rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to do the miracles and all the things he did. He wouldn't do anything the Father didn't tell him to do, right? He, I only do what the Father tells me. I only say what the Father tells me. He was completely subservient to to the Father and all this stuff, and, and that was a decision. And, and, and he loved the disciples, and he loved the people, and he made this decision because he loved, but it was incredibly intentional. Everything he did was intentional. And let me tell you why I think this is super important. Um, intentionality means you make a decision that you're going to be in covenant with God in a certain way. Right? When I, when I became a believer, or you became a believer, it wasn't just some experiential high, you know, some spiritual high that, that oh my gosh, this feels great. Because sometimes as a Christian, it doesn't feel great. Some, I mean, honestly, your, your emotions go up and down and all around and around. But you make a decision, and you say, I'm going to follow Jesus. And a lot of the church language is really, for men, is really uncomfortable. It's really soft. It's very feminine, actually. This is why a lot of men don't attend church, by the way. Um, the, the language in there about love and all this kind of stuff, we're just like, can we talk about loyalty? Can we talk about sacrifice, you know, instead of... You know, God is love and all these things. But it's because we have a misunderstanding of love. Uh, love is intention. Love is decision. Love is decisiveness. Love is this concept that I decide I'm going to bear with you. I love you, so I decide I'm going to forgive you. I love you, I decide that I'm going to show mercy and grace. I love you, and I decide that I'm going to be intentional about following Jesus and doing what he told me to do, which, which is not judge, love my enemies, pray for those who persecute me, bear with those, forgive as I've been forgiven, don't judge, yes, you be judged. All of the commands Jesus gave us. I love, so I intentionally do. And this is where words and actions are really important when they add up. I see, uh, like you, so many Christians out there, so-called Christians, that decide to follow Jesus but aren't intentional about the walk right they they maybe got baptized when they were in high school or whatever or or they are a, a, a Sunday church person and, and a Wednesday spaghetti dinner person whatever or they do a Bible study or something but they're not intentional about their walk and their life doesn't look a whole lot like Jesus uh, because there's no intentionality to it and they will tell you they love Jesus right I, I was one of those guys for decades um, I love Jesus. I, I could quote the Bible. I, I, yeah, I was that guy. But I wasn't intentional about my life. I was intentional about doing what I wanted to do out of my selfishness. I was intentional about, you know, how I thought about things. But I wasn't intentional about picking up my cross and following him. I wasn't intentional about hating this world and, and, and restoring up my treasures in heaven. And I wasn't intentional. I wasn't intentional about any of that stuff. And so when you read scripture, and it's telling you, you got to do all these things. Got to do X, Y, Z. A lot of people are like, oh, man, it seems like so much you got to do. Well, not really. What you got to do is be intentional. When you decide to follow Jesus, you have to say, yeah, I, I'm actually going to do this. And, and here's why. Love doesn't conquer all. Love doesn't conquer all. You can love Jesus all you want. And, and Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21, away from the evildoer. And people are like, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Didn't we do all this stuff in your name? Didn't we call you Lord, Lord? Aren't we following you? And he says, no, you're really not, because you're not doing things that I told you to do for the reasons I told you to do it. You're doing things for your reasons for you. And it's not that you love me and being intentional about doing that. It's that you love you and you're intentional about doing that. So here's the big question tonight as, as you get started here. Who do you love more, yourself or God? 
And everyone's going to say God, but hey, whoa, 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 slow down there. Um, do you? What does your life look like? Are you sold out? Are, are you really, really sold out? Or are you doing a bunch of stuff in your life that looks just like everybody else? Um, that really is about your self-motivation and not about what God tells you to do because you're not being intentional in your walk. Uh, I mean, this is this is hard stuff. And it goes beyond spending your time in prayer and spending your time in your Bible and, you know, in fellowship and those kind of things. This goes to um, you're, you're taking every thought captive, which is one of the hardest things we all have to do, especially for men. Um, women deal with negative self-talk. Men deal with lust issues. Uh, can you take every thought captive to Christ, as we're told to? Work as if you're working to the Lord. So everything you do is a ministry. There's not one thing you do when you leave uh, that you don't do for the Lord. Uh, can can you can you think about dying to yourself? Are there are there things that just need to die in you? Pleasures, wants, desires, whatever it is. Are you prioritized right? Are your priorities the same as God's priorities? If you were to say, here's my list of priorities. I wonder how God thinks about them. Eek! You might find that they're not the same. Um, all these kind of things at the deeper level of your walk uh, have to be intentional. My, my wife says here, agape love is intentional because it is sacrificial. Well, I could tell you that if it's true agape, that's true. Absolutely, it's sacrificial. But many people think that they have agape love, um, brotherly love in the, in the faith. That's not very sacrificial. And I'll be honest with you. I, 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 one of my banes of, of the Christian, um, I guess, corporate structure is it is so hard to try to work with other Christian pastors. It is impossible almost. I have had more trouble trying to get other pastors to partner with me on stuff. And when I was in business, it was no problem to get people to partner with you. I didn't get anybody at the table. But the minute you get faith leaders to try to do something, they just, I don't know if they don't know how to do it. I don't know if they don't learn it in seminary. I don't know if they don't care. I, it is the weirdest thing. Everyone's got their lane and they don't, they don't really sacrifice for each other. And that's why the church is as splintered and fractured and impotent as it is, because the, the, the church doesn't work together well, because they aren't having agape love, because they aren't sacrificing for each other, because they aren't intentional about using each other as force multipliers. You'll read and hear sermons after sermon after uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 saying, each body part has a separate function and all of us in the faith have a separate role and we have all these spiritual gifts. And if we just work together, la di da di da where do you see it? And you're going to get me off a soapbox here because I, it just makes me so angry um, that that I was I was under an impression when I first got into ministry that you know we'd all help each other, and that is just not how it works. And uh, um, it's it's sad that the the secular business world is an easier environment to navigate in terms of networking and working together than the Christian environment ever will be. And so um, I'll stop there because I can just go off on that. Um, so when we talk about uh, this, this idea of, of being a disciple and putting Jesus first and, and this idea that nothing can come before him, uh, yeah, you got to measure the cross. And this is why. Not only does he say you got to hate your mom and dad and all that kind of stuff. And he's, he's making a very uh, distinct point that I'm number one, everyone else comes after me. But he says some other things. He says, the world is going to hate you because they hated me first. He says, you're going to be persecuted and you're going to uh, undergo scrutiny and, and you're going to be an outcast and you're, the world's going to hate you. You're, you're not going to fit in to everything that's going on here. You're going to seem like a really crazed, lunatic, loser, just nerdy guy because you're following Jesus. And there's going to come a point, I think, I never thought I'd see this in my lifetime, but I think I'm going to, that where, where those of us in, in the faith, that are truly in the faith, are going to be seen as the crazies. Where, where it used to be mainstream, you know, Christianity was the mainstream. To, today, we're moving toward a point of, of so severely post-Christian, so, so self-absorbed, so selfish in everyone's view, that the moral relativism, uh, the idea that my truth is as good as your truth, and there is no absolute truth, they're pushing the, those of us in faith who believe in an absolute truth absolutely into the crazy zone. And, and we're the guys that, that need to be locked up because we're just, you know, are, are nuts. 
for me, being a baby boomer, you're like, what what the heck happened? And I definitely blame uh, the the baby boomers above me, that hippie generation. They screwed it up for all of us. All of us. Um, but here we are. And and so you you look at this and say, okay, what does all this mean? If if I, I need to be intentional, well, it it means that um, if, if you're in any relationship, God said, love Him and love others, right? Jesus said the greatest commandment was to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and the second is like it to love each other as you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then He gives another commandment when He leaves. He says, I got another commandment for you. You need to love each other the way I've loved you, which is the sacrificial piece that Lisa was talking about, about the agape. So we have this, this idea that God is love and love is sacrificial and that we have to be intentional about it and that it's a decision, not, not a feeling. And everything's about relationship. So the first thing you have to do is you got to look at your relationships and say, am I intentional about them? Right? I, I see a lot of relationships falter uh, because there's a lack of intense intentionality. What I mean by that is they don't intentionally sacrifice for one another. They don't intentionally try to change into the image of Christ that he's made them to be. They hold on to their selfishness or their pride or whatever it might be, their own ideas, even though God says, rely not on your own understanding, uh, but in all the ways put, you know, rely on God and he'll be a light to your path. Basically, if I wanted the message version, it says, stop being stupid and, and, and trust God. Uh, we don't do that. And, and these relationships fall apart. And it's not that these people don't have feelings and care about each other in those relationships. It's just that they're not intentional. Uh, marriages in the Christian church fall apart because they're not intentional. They, they don't intentionally sacrifice themselves to the covenant they made with God in the marriage. Uh, you, you know, how many Christian marriages do they even talk about the covenant relationship that that it's a covenant of three, not two, and the fact that that when you marry in front of the Lord and you're you're committing yourselves, that the most important thing is pleasing God. The second most important thing is the marriage. The third most important thing is your spouse. The fourth most important thing is you. You you come last in 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 that covenant relationship, and and we get really. You know, we really struggle with that because we want to be first. Every one of us wants to be first. I want to be first. Uh, we all want what we want. But if you're intentional about it, you can bear all things, right? You can you can have perseverance and have character growth, and you can grow in the Lord and your faith. You can, uh, you know, have amazing, miraculous things happen to you in terms of transformation if you're intentional. But I see a lot of, of Christians that just are not intentional. They believe that believing is enough. And, you know, from salvation's perspective, sure, believing is enough. But is that how you want to live? G Jesus says, I want you to have life. I want you to have it abundantly. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Um, I am, will abide in you. you. You will abide in me. I am the branch. You are the vine. You know, all, all those different things he said. Uh, it means being intentional, though. And it means like, you know, you can say you love Jesus all day long. And, and, but what does it really mean? Does it, does it mean you go to church? Does it mean you believe him as your Lord and Savior? Does it believe, mean that you're going to sacrifice your life for his? The same way he sacrificed his life for you. I mean, what does it all mean? I don't know. Um, I, I think each of us is on a different path and are a different place in our, in our walk. But I know for me, intentionality uh, is, you know, when I had my awakening about really coming to the Lord after, you know, kind of pretending for all those years, um, or at least, let me put it this way, I thought I knew Jesus, but I didn't know him. And when I finally met him, uh, it fundamentally changed. I had that road to Damascus kind of episode where, oh, holy mackerel, that's who you are. Um, yeah, I became very intentional about trying to follow and allow transformation and, and uh, pray about that kind of stuff. To this day, I'm trying to get transformation. I pray about it all the time. I'm going to take a drink real quick. <coughs> what is it when I talk to you? I have to cough. I don't know what's going on here. So um, I'm going to read chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. <coughs> this is the so-called love chapter. It's at every wedding. Um, I don't read it during weddings because, well, it's not for weddings. Uh, the, the context of it is... Paul is is talking to the church at Corinth, 
And I'm going to read you the, the, the whole chapter because I'm, and I'm stopping pieces of it and talking about it. He says, again, Apostle Paul, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a banging gong or a clanging cymbal. I love that. I mean, he's basically saying, you know, I could, I could speak in the tongues of angels. I could, I could, I could really wow you with miracles. I could, I could speak all this stuff. I could, I could preach basically, but I don't love. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm banging gong. I love that. Francis Chan, who's a, a preacher I like, <clears throat> once said that he has to, he has to pray that he loves the people he preaches to before he preaches to them, uh, because you can't preach without loving people. Uh, I think that preaching is a labor of love. I mean, you really have to feel that you're making a difference for people, that the words that God's giving you is is important for people to hear and that you care about people enough for them to hear it. Because honestly, you know, it's Friday night. It's been a long week. Um, I've had a long day. I, I, Wednesday, I think I had eight appointments, kind of burned out. And uh, I could have skipped tonight, you know. Um, I could have spent a nice Friday, quiet Friday night with my wife and, and you know, ate dinner and watched Netflix or something. But I care about you. I love you guys. And, and I want to give you the message that he's put on my heart because somebody out there needs to hear it. And God uses me as the vessel to do that. And, and so um, you have to love in order to preach. And he says, if you just preach without having love, you're just a banging gong. Uh, and it does mean sacrifice. I mean, those, you know, a lot of times you don't think about your pastors, your preachers sacrificing pretty much. You think maybe it's about them or not. It's not. Preparation time goes into this stuff. And um, time out of our, our life goes into this stuff. And, and it's not just a job. It's, it's a calling. It, it, God has called us to this. And so we've answered the call. And, and so I love what he says here. That you're just a banging gong if you don't actually love the people you're talking to. And I, and I agree with that a thousand percent. And he says, if I have prophetic powers, which means that you can, um, you know, in that day and age, it was a kind of, we think of prophecy as future stuff. But in, in his day too, prophetic was being able to interpret the scriptures and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have all faith, so as to remove mountain, as to remove mountains, remember Jesus says, you have enough faith, you can move a mountain. But I have not love, I am nothing. So what he's saying is, I, I could do all this stuff. I could do miracles. I could move a mountain. I could I could be this incredible, uh, faithful person. But if I don't love, who cares? What's the point? And it goes back to what Jesus said. The greatest command is to love God, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else flows underneath that. But you can't do it if you're not intentional. See, you, you, know, you can... You can, you can preach, you can, you can teach, you can do all this stuff he's talking about. But love takes intention. And so now he says, if, if I give away all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not loved, I've gained nothing. I've gained nothing. And this is, this is the, the preface he's using before he gets into the stuff you really know from chapter 13. He's basically saying, I could be the greatest Christian that ever walked the earth since Jesus and if I don't love people, it doesn't matter a lick. And again, it goes back to Matthew 7, 21, where Jesus says, on that day, man will call me Lord, Lord. You think you love me, but you don't. You weren't intentional about it. You didn't sacrifice. You didn't give up. You, you, didn't, you didn't do the things for the right motives. You, you uh, had no intentionality in this love for me. And, and yeah, I mean, but then here we go. And I've preached on this a couple of times, so forgive me if you've seen this part before. It says, love is patient and love is kind. Well, I tell you what, you have to be fairly intentional to be patient, right? How many people are really patient? Most of us are very impatient. And it's because we're not intentional. We're, we're, just, we're just like, I want it now. Uh, but to be patient and to be kind, you have to intend to do so. You have to decide, I'm going to be patient. And I'm going to be kind to somebody. So you're at the grocery store and someone needs a, an encouraging word. You do that. My friend Matea had a situation where... She was working and she had an opportunity to talk to a customer who was having a hard day. And she was very intentional about uh, engaging that person. And it went, went really well. But it was intentional. It, it was on purpose. She thought through it. She, she knew the cost, right? And, and that was a great thing she did. Love does not envy or boast. Uh, it is not arrogant. Well, I, I will tell you, for most women, that's not a problem. Men, we are boastful like crazy. Uh, we have to be intentional to be humble. 
because in our culture and men culture if there's such a thing anymore this is in my generation um big boys don't cry you suck it up there you 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 pat yourself on the back for just about everything you do you you are the greatest thing since sliced bread you ego is not our problem uh and and humility is and so what he's saying is that you have to to be humble well that takes a lot of intentionality right i remember when i was struggling with this um because i those of you who know me knows i know i wasn't the most humble person ever uh i came across philippians 2 3 through 5 which said do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit but in all things consider others better than yourself when thinking about your own interests put the interests of others first and then you'll be doing as christ that became my life my, my life first because it was like wow that just puts it in a nutshell doesn't it put other people before you tom and when i started doing that i started to learn a little bit about humility and you can't love somebody unless you have humility because you have to put yourself second to them sometimes right so see how this see how this intentionality lines you up to to be able to love the right way um, it's not irritable or resentful it's not rude it doesn't insist on its own way all of that stuff is intentionally putting yourself in a humble position and not getting re, you know irritable or resentful about it um, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing right now come on how many how many of you actually kind of secretly like it when your enemy fails <laughs> we all we all kind of rejoice a little bit about that um, we shouldn't be it, you know true love is you really do feel bad when even if your enemy screws up um, you know I, I, I was watching today president comes out and says he's got COVID and a lot of people would say you know serves him right but I was like I like Joe Biden and his wife came out and said hey we're praying for you and those two don't couldn't even agree on what sandwich they have for lunch right now but that was a that was a class move because that's what you're supposed to do and that, that was that was leadership right there uh, it says that uh, uh, we rejoice in the truth love rejoices in the truth well there's some intentionality to that sometimes the truth hurts doesn't it sometimes the truth is not what we want to rejoice in sometimes the truth is painful and uh, there are hard truths and uh, uh, there is tough love out there right and uh, you got to rejoice in that and you and you've got to be intentional about saying you know there's some wisdom there I don't particularly like it but I'm going to intentionally follow it there's uh, a guy named Henry Cloud that he wrote a book called boundaries and he does a lot of speaking and I went to a conference once where he was a speaker and he said that in the Bible there are three basic types of people there are, are wise people there are fools and there are evil people and so I think this microphone is getting something in my throat every time I get close to it, it gets me <clears throat> so the wise people you can correct them and they'll thank you right so have you ever known a wise person that you did something like yeah you know not doing it quite right and you correct them in love and in grace right <coughs> you don't you don't hammer them and they thank you they go, yeah man I, I think I'm glad you did that those are wise people fools I love what he said about fools you'll correct them and they'll mock you <laughs> according to scripture they'll just make fun of you and they'll just beat up on you for that they're not completely lost yet fools can be turned but you know they're really hard they're really hard to talk to and he says then there's evil people and evil people just want to burn your house down you can't talk to them at all and and so when we talk about rejoicing the truth and I love rejoices in the truth the idea of it about being intentional is being intentionally wise being someone who will take constructive criticism will take information um, and even when when somebody accuses you of something you look for the truth in it if there's any and you you accept the truth and you throw out the bad stuff right uh so that's intentionality though you can't just react most people just react and uh, and the reaction's bad it's defensiveness and it's 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 uh blame shifting or excuse making or justifications or whatever it is instead of thinking through it and being a wise person and taking taking counsel uh, on that and and that's an intentionality and that has to be a learned behavior right that's something that we don't do naturally love bears all things believes all things hopes all things endures all things um not if it's not intentional it doesn't uh it's amazing how uh friendships uh, work relationships even intimate relationships how people will be offended by each other because love isn't intentional in those relationships they're not bearing with all things they're not believing all things 
they're holding on to grudges they're not forgiving um, they're they're bitter about situations and and every little situation that comes up is just one more uh, drop in the bucket of of the, the, the continuing bitterness that's 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 evolving and so love will bear all things so long as you're intentional about it right but I, I'm here to tell you that that uh, it says love never ends well Jesus Jesus's love never ends I, I can't say that for people um, I, I, I personally have been amazed to watch uh, in other people's lives and my own uh, how people will say they love you but then their mind will change or time will pass and they just don't and and it's something that for me is always just blowing my mind because that's never been my orientation but love's never supposed to end and i think that we have that in our heart i think that's why heart heartbreak happens so much when when love ends is because it, it, it god put this in our heart that love never ends his love for us never ends and this is why you got to fill your your god hole with the right stuff instead of the wrong stuff that way that love will never end and and it will be a love that's intentional because god's love to us is very intentional why would he put up with us otherwise right um and your love for god has to be intentional and your love for each other has to be intentional or it's not going to work i mean it's just it's just not going to be great he says here prophecies they will pass and for tongues they will cease how about that people will stop talking in tongues but uh for we know in part uh, that we prophesy in part, but when we, when, uh, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So he's talking about when Jesus comes, everything uh, that we don't quite see quite yet uh, passes away, and we'll see things clearly. Uh, so when when we talk about this last part, you know, he talks here about um, when he was a child, he felt like a child. Now he's an adult, thinks like a mature person. Uh, we see through the, the the glass darkly, that kind of stuff. But then there's this part here at the end. He says this. I know I now know in part then I shall be fully known so when Jesus comes he'll be fully known even then uh, he will fully know so that you know you get this perfected thing and it says so now faith hope and love abide these three but the greatest of these is love and you know great that's that's perfect scripture but but if it's not intentional I still I still think you're a banging gong um, if if you're not really doing what Jesus said, you know, he made all these commands. He said lots and lots of stuff. And certainly we're forgiven for our lapses and our sin nature and all that kind of stuff from a theological perspective and the dogma of it. But if you're not intentional about really selling out to Jesus, I worry about you. If If you're my friends out there, and I have a lot of them, who don't go to church, um, don't read the Bible, pray every once in a while, uh, maybe even every night. Um, they're believers in God, right? They, they know who Jesus is, but they're not intentional about it, and their life doesn't look any different than anybody else's life. Um, I'm worried about you. I, I, I love you. I don't want you to be with me in heaven. Uh, and it's not a free pass. This this isn't like everyone gets to heaven because you know who Jesus is. Satan knows who Jesus is. He's not going to heaven. Uh, so intentionality, I just want to talk about some some steps to get there some steps to get there grab a kleenex i don't know i've got allergies or something tonight something's going on how do you how do you get to be intentional well one i i think you have to go back to scripture and see what jesus told us to do right um there, there's so much i actually did a study once and, and I, I was trying to make a point during church and I, I got all the commands of jesus and there were like 300 of them that i printed off and i put them on sheet after sheet after sheet eight and a half by 11 and i taped all the sheets together and i said how many of you know the commands of jesus and, and some people were like ah oh, don't judge or forgive your enemies and blah 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 and i rolled this thing out for effect and people were like stunned because you know you know the biggies um, but if you really read the Gospels, Jesus said a heck of a lot of stuff. And uh, every one of his parables is is commands. Everything that he, you know, he talks about the kingdom of God being like these things. And, you, you know, you sell everything to get it. And he's basically saying nothing on this earth matters. You need to get the kingdom of heaven. Um, store up your treasures in heaven. Well, what does that look like? It's about your crowns. It's, you know, there's so much in there in the Gospels that 
when you really start to like pour into it, you know, take a highlighter and pour into the, what Jesus said. Look at the red letters if you have a red letter Bible, and say, "Am I doing that? Am I intentionally every day waking up and saying I'm going to do this?" And honestly, I mean, it's a big list, so it's hard to just uh, you know get your head wrapped around it. But to love Jesus means to do what he says, because that's what he says, right? Remember what he says, if you love me, you'll do what I command. And then later in Luke, he says, if you say you love me, why don't you do what I tell you to do, right? He equates loving him, because he said it, with doing what he said. And, and doing what he said is really, really hard. You have to die to yourself. All the things of this world that intrigue you, that are shiny, that you want, you got to die to that. It can't have any meaning. It doesn't mean you can't have it. You want to go out on Amazon and buy a book tomorrow, go to Amazon and buy a book tomorrow. But it can't have value beyond its worldly value. It doesn't have the value of Jesus, right? You're, I, I have a lot of friends that lost their homes in the, in the fires. I think I know at least three people that did. And, you know, feel bad for them. It's great. It, you know, it's, it's a great loss. But it shouldn't mean anything. Because they have their lives, they have the Lord, they'll rebuild. I mean, you lose some memories, but you know what? When we die, who's going to care? We're going to be in heaven. And you got to have that perspective. And when you can get that perspective and you can understand what's important, because Jesus says, don't store your treasures here. Nothing, there's Everything's going to rot. You know, nothing matters here. And when you can put those things in perspective and die to yourself, where it doesn't matter how much stuff you have, just that, that it doesn't matter to you, it doesn't have any value to you. What values is, you know, it has value is your relationship with Jesus, period. I mean, whether you live in a house or live in a box, it doesn't matter. What matters is your relationship with Jesus. And for a guy like me, I'm lucky. I got a lot of stuff, and I've accumulated a lot of stuff over the years. And when the fires were here, it was kind of funny. I was thinking about if our place caught fire, I was like, eh, there's some, some paperwork I probably need to keep and a couple of things I'd like to make sure that we don't lose, um, you know, for documentation purposes. But eh, if everything burns up, everything burns up. I like some of my, my, my research books and stuff, but they're all replaceable. Who cares? And I was joking with my wife that if our place burned down and the dojo burned down, I could build a bigger dojo and um, and we could, you know, rebuild the place. I, it's not a big deal. You know why? Because my wife and I have Jesus. And we have a covenant relationship and a marriage. And that's what matters. That's it. That's all that matters. And no matter what happened here, I could preach. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to stop me from doing that. And so um, it's, it's, it's all great stuff. And that's intentionality, is, is, is that dying to yourself and dying to this world and understanding, you know, where our value is. That's the first step. You have to pray to the Holy Spirit that he transforms you. Um, every one of us has an area where we're not transformed. Uh, if, if we didn't, we'd be perfect, right? We're not going to be perfect. So you got to pray to the Holy Spirit that he will continually work to transform you. That, that 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 you will be uh, reveal to you those things that need to change in you. Uh, I know what they are for me. Uh, it seems like a slow go. I've been praying about it forever. Um, you know, I, have you ever made that prayer like I have that that you would just wish the Holy Spirit would take your free will away because you made your decision? Can we just get rid of this now? Um, the answer is no. Uh, but that's intentionality. If you want so badly to do what Jesus tells you to that you're like, just take my free will. I don't, I don't care. Just I just want to follow you. And you get that answer back. My grace is sufficient, right? So you got to pray. You really need to know what scripture says. I mean, this is, this is the hard part. When I was uh, early in my faith, and, and uh, I think I'd read the Bible once through by the time I, I had my awakening, and, and I'd read various passages, I just didn't see the, the, the huge value in, in memorizing or knowing scripture. And, uh, and I'm not great at memorization anyway. But I've learned now that I've read the Bible through several times and, and how the Holy Spirit brings verses up, you got to know your scripture. And you don't have to know the address, as they say, you know, Matthew 17, 12. You, you, need, to, you need to know what it says. You need to know how the Old Testament and New Testament connect you need to know how the Old Testament talks all about Jesus and how Jesus absolutely uh, quoted the Old Testament to prove he is who he is. 
you need to see all this stuff. You need to see the logic in God's reasoning and how he does things. You, you know, all that stuff. Because what it does is, it shows you how to be intentional. You know, God says, I knew your name before you were born. I had plans to prosper you. Um, I had good works for you to do before the beginning of time. All these things. Well, if you can see that he has planned all these things, then you can understand that you were given intellect and reason to plan too. And like Jesus, you, 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 you measure the cost. Am I willing to do it? And that, I think that's the, the big sticking point. I say this last point. So you, so you, you know, you, you've recognized some things. You, you're praying about it. You're learning scripture. You're going to do what Jesus tells you to do. Here's the last point. And it wraps around right back to the first point. Are you willing to pay the cost? You know, God sometimes asks you to do some things that are just crazy, at least from a worldly perspective. I've had to quit two well-paying jobs. One was my career, lifelong ambition job because God asked me to quit them, to follow him and do what he wanted me to do. And it was really, a, a, a for me, because my identity was tied up in my work and my titles, it was it was a, a absolute uh, crossroads for me, whether I was going to follow or not. And I did, I, both times I did. Um, and it's crazy, you know, think about it. You know, I, I am a guy in, in my, my prime earning years quitting work so I can do ministry for free. Yay, here on the internet during COVID. But it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And it was the right decision to do. And God has blessed me beyond measure because of it. Um, and and wow, I would have never thought that. I, I really thought that, well, okay, I'll do what God says, and then we'll downsize, and we'll downsize, and, you know, we'll live in an apartment, and you know, whatever it might be. That's not, that was not God's plan. Uh, he, he was testing my faithfulness, and, and he was faithful to me afterwards. He will ask you to do crazy things. And so when you measure the cost of doing what Jesus says, there will be things that are hard. And not everyone will like you, and not all your friends will be your friends anymore. And, I mean, when you really sell out versus just being someone who's a, a Christian, and it's one thing to say, I'm a Christian, I believe in God, yay. Um, when you sell out and you start acting like a Christian in all phases of your life, things change. Uh, I, always, I always joke that people love to do Christian stuff until it's time to do Christian stuff. You know, when you have to forgive that person who did some heinous thing, when you have to um, bear with somebody who is unbearable, when you have to love somebody who's completely unlovable, um, those are really challenging things for, for your walk. And unfortunately, lots of people who say they're Christians are not intentional about their walk. They haven't made the decision to love. They haven't said that they're going to be in covenant with God over these things. And when the rubber meets the road, they fall away. But didn't Jesus say that was going to happen? This is the, the, the disturbing part when you're talking about Jesus and Matthew. He says, you're going to hear wars and rumors of wars and you know earthquakes. All these things are going to come to pass. And he even says people are going to, that were in the faith, are going to leave the faith. And this is like at the end time stuff. But you're like, people in the faith are going to leave the faith? I mean, I can't even imagine leaving the faith. But those people that leave the faith are not intentional. It was like the 70 disciples who were following Jesus when it was a great idea to follow Jesus because they thought he was going to be the Messiah King who was going to conquer Rome and he was going to take Israel back for the Israelites. And then he starts teaching this hard stuff about you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, this, this uh, precursor, this typing of communion that was going to happen. And they walked away and they said, this, this teaching is too hard for us. They weren't intentional about following Jesus. They weren't intentional about learning what he had to say. They weren't intentional about listening to the meaning of the message. All they did was heard the words and walked away. And um, too often, you know, that, that happens within our faith too. People hear the message and like, I don't like the message. You know, I don't like what the Bible says. I, I don't like the hypocrites in the church. I don't like this. I don't like that. Okay. Well, you're not really trying to listen to what Jesus is saying because he addresses all of those things what you're listening to is yourself and again once again you're leaning on your own understanding and you're not leaning on the lord and you're not sold out and you're not intentional you are about you you're not about jesus because once you get to be intentional it's all about jesus uh, there's nothing else you get to a place where you understand there is nothing else but jesus 
uh, as a friend of mine puts it, there is no plan B. There's only plan A, right? And so I just want to encourage you tonight that to, to be thinking about um, this idea of are you intentional in, in your walk or not. Um, love doesn't conquer all. The fact that you say you love Jesus, but you're not intentional about following him, you're not intentional about doing what he commands, means you don't really love him. And that love will grow cold. Just like the churches, you know, if you read in Revelations, uh, I think 2 or 3, yeah, chapter 2, 3, where he's talking about the churches, and they, they talk about, I think it was a church at Ephesus, they had lost their first love. Their love had grown cold. Well, it wasn't an intentional love. They didn't love Jesus. They they had let it go cold because they were not intentional about it. So I just want to encourage you to give yourself some some uh, some self-analysis. Romans 12 tells us that we should have a sober judgment of ourselves. Um, so have a sober judgment of yourself. Review your walk with Christ. Where are you not being intentional? And all of us have it. I mean, I'm not, just don't even go there and say you're intentional everywhere. All of us are having places where we're not intentional where we're not really doing what Jesus said, where we're not really even trying to do what Jesus said. And it's part of our walk, and it's okay, right? His grace is sufficient for us. But I want you to be sold out. I want everyone that that is, is within earshot of me to understand the, the incredible benefit, the incredible blessing of being sold out for Jesus, that everything you do is about him. If you can put it in your mind to do that, pray unceasingly, um, just meditate on his word, do all the things that, that uh, he calls us to do, your life will fundamentally change. Now, I'm not going to say it's going to go well in the world for you, but I will say that spiritually, you will be so filled and so full of joy, uh, it won't matter. It just won't matter. So, um, yeah, love doesn't conquer all. Intentionality does. And uh, I hope that I've made a little bit of sense tonight. I know it's a little weird of a topic, but uh, if you go back to that love chapter chapter of 1 Corinthians 13, you go back to uh, the Luke 14 chapters and, and talk about Jesus uh, measuring the cost of things, I think you can, you, can, you can tie those things together and understand a little bit of what I'm talking about. So anyway, it's been a great Friday night. I hope you've had a little bit of fun. I have. I always do. And uh, um, I think I'm back Tuesday. I'm not sure. Maybe Tuesday uh, for some Anka Place. So um, until then, I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Talk to you soon.